Hello everyone, my name is Mike and I'm an in-house consultant here at The Profs, but consultancy is not all I do. I also work as a tutor in maths, physics and occasionally computer science, which is really, really relevant to the topic of today's video, considering that we're going to be talking about how to get an A star in A-level computer science. It's become an incredibly popular A-level subject for people to take, um, not only because it's extremely accessible, more accessible than it used to ever be uh, for students, but with the wider implications of where we're going with lots of different industries and how humanity is generally progressing, we can't really escape some having some necessary understanding of that subject. And many universities are looking to actually have this in their rosters as well. If you are looking at going into a computing degree or a computer science degree, um, just check any one of our videos, wherever they are on the screen, um, and you should be able to find, actually, an example of where computer science A-level is very relevant. So the question we're going to be answering in today's video is how do we get that A-star? Well, I'm going to be giving a few of my tips to hopefully help you with your revision and learning of the topic, and hopefully an assertion of the grade. So my first tip in getting an A-star in A-level computer science is make sure that you try to understand the fundamentals as much as possible. Early on in your A-level, you're gonna be introduced to a lot of very vague general concepts in a way that you've not been taught at a GCC before. So the earlier you get an understanding of what is going on, the better equipped you're gonna be with the rest of your A-level. So this is something that is very true early on in the process. But if we look outside of perhaps what the syllabus is, and we'll get into the syllabus a little bit later, um, I would even be suggesting you do want to develop some programming experience in at least three or four different languages. If you look at professional programmers nowadays, they have roughly seven or eight programming languages to their name. Um, so if we were to go off of this very similar idea that you want to diversify your experiences in programming, make sure that you are also expanding the languages that you need to understand beyond just what is in your A-level specification. So, I mean, some popular choices. We've got Python, which is very, very common. Everybody goes for that. We've got C Sharp, which I know is incredibly important with games design and lots of other variants of C, like C++, for instance, and just plain old C. But languages that people don't get into as much are things like Fortran, for instance, uh, which is a very deep level language that allows you to construct your own types of operations and like in a, opposed to just the variables, which is a really, really powerful if you actually want to get into software development when you're building things from the ground up. Um, we also have languages like R, which is used for a lot of statistical analysis. If you're a little bit mathsy, this might be a good language to investigate if you are also doing maths A-level. If you're interested in looking at how to get an A-star in A-level maths, click on the video up here. I'm sure it would be useful to you as well as this video. But other than the theory and the programming, make sure that you're applying it to some kind of a project to bring it all together. Um, and that is either going to be through additional sort of assignments that you can get in class or through your own research projects yourself which you might be wanting to record on GitHub just to have a record of all of your programming sort of experiences. Might be a nice thing for you to look back on and sort of recollect sort of your thoughts on or just meditate on a little bit, but it does make for a really great portfolio for future employers and potentially people within an admissions team at a university. Now, beyond that, going into my next tip, I would say the Next best thing I would be doing with an A-level like this, and this is very prevalent when you're getting ready for an exam, is looking at your specification, treat it like your Bible. What do I mean by that? You are looking at your specification every day. You are literally looking at every single bullet point, and each of those bullet points are telling you within the specification what you need to know, what you're going to be tested on. Sometimes those bullet points are definitions that you need to be able to recite offhand at whatever time. So if you're looking at this on a regular basis, even if you don't know everything yet, not only do you get an understanding of where the A-level is going to go, but you're also going to have an idea as to how your A-level papers will eventually be structured when you take them. 
And that is going to give you an added level of confidence on top of your peers and hopefully give you a better exam performance when it comes around to it. Now, we haven't yet talked about rev the revision aspect of that. This is probably going to be a little bit more relevant to people who are just about to take their exams. But as soon as you have covered your syllabus, this could even actually be very applicable to those of you who are in the middle of your A-level, who have got unit tests coming up. But I would get into this practice early of setting up a revision timetable of when are you going to revise particular topics and in what order. So this is what I tend to do, whether it's with a topic test or whether it's with an entire A-level. I would use what is known as the traffic light system to work out where my strengths and weaknesses lie within a topic. Then I would purposefully start with my weakest topic out of that list, revise that to a point where you understand everything that is going on, and then I would move to my next weakest topic, and so on. And then I would also at the same time be taking regular tests just to see how well I'm able to answer a question because there is a difference in understanding something and then being able to communicate what you understand. They are very, very different skills and an exam is testing for both of those. So you want to make sure you get equal practice in both of these areas, particularly in computer science where most of the work that we do is on the computer with programs um, and maybe sort of just answering yes or no questions if we're having to like work out the complexity of a, a particular algorithm. Um, it's going to be very different at the skills that are needed to assess a business practice, which does come up with computer science in terms of what we should be doing, um, maybe as an IT specialist or a computer science specialist in that company to help optimize their proceedings. So the earlier the exposure, the better. Make sure that you're exercising problem solving at the same time as you're doing the theory. That creates an incredible amount of growth for any computer science A-level student. Following on from what I've just said, we're going to focus on this a little bit more heavily, especially with those longer answers. You want to be able to get into the practice of doing this with some of your homeworks and assignments too. Um, make sure that especially your longer answers, they're well planned, they're well constructed, and they're clear and concise. So there's a lot of things that are in there. We'll try to break things down bit by bit. So we want them to be well structured. So we can't just go into writing a question without at least thinking about what kind of answer we're going to give because we don't have the time necessarily. I mean, the temptation would be we don't have the time in an exam to be able to think. In reality, we do. We actually have more time than we think we do to be able to work out what we're going to say. So utilize that time. I usually would spend between five to 10 minutes to maybe plan out maybe a really, really long answer to something. And then when I've done that, um, that's when I can kind of write out what I want to say. But it tends to be less words mean more in exam settings. This is a very, very particular thing to say. So this is where the conciseness comes in. If we're using too many words to describe one thing, and I know I've done this a few times, so I'm also guilty of it, then we will lose the reader's interest or it might make it harder for the reader to understand what you're saying. And we don't want that in any situation. So this is very much a transferable skill, but this does apply to homeworks and exams within computer science, pretty much all in one go. So make sure that when you are writing, you try to write what you want to say, including sort of the logic that connects everything with as few words as possible. And that will make it sound like you've really thought about what you wanted to say, and you've also got something down on the page. So get into this practice early, especially if you get given a homework where you have to write an essay about a particular industry practice within computer science or from a computer science perspective. Getting into that perspective and looking at industry practice, another um, another way that you could perhaps get into this, and this is going into my final point, is looking at the NEA, the non-examination assessment. Um, and this isn't with every single A-level, um, or this is not with every single exam board more so. I know that you, you don't necessarily have an NEA with the Cambridge version of the computer science A-level, but that could change, you know, by the time that this video is made, 
Uh, we don't know. But for a lot of examples out there, you have to do one. It's about 20 to 30% of your overall A level. And that is almost like you doing a, an, a smaller version of an extended project qualification. You do get help from your teachers, so lean on them in terms of knowing what to do. But you want to make sure that you plan out something that you know you can do within a, a short amount of time and you know that you can set yourself targets to. So one thing I go back to whenever I'm looking at sort of longer projects like this are smart targets, establishing those. I'm not going to tell you what they stand for. I want you to look those up yourself. But if you can say in particular with a longer project that your targets or your objectives are smart, reaching or ticking a box on every single one of those letters, then you are doing very, very well. And you can be rest assured that maybe it's a project that you can achieve. But if you're not sure how to set them up, do lean on your teachers a little bit just to get a second opinion of how that kind of project is turning out. And hopefully that will give you con confidence to get the majority of already 20 to 30 percent of your A level before you even take your exams. So, I mean, that would be absolutely amazing, but do reach out for help. Hey there, I hope you enjoyed that video. If you have, make sure you leave a comment in the comment section below. If you have any questions, we'd love to hear some discussions from you. Um, otherwise, if you think that this video is gonna be useful for your friends or family, please share it. If you've liked it, make sure you like and subscribe to our channel. And if you wanna get in touch with a tutor like me or any one of our subject experts on this, then please have a look at the information on screen and make sure you get in contact. And as always, best of luck with your application.